Welcome to Truth Currents. Last week, I began to talk to you about how to vote for president. Not who to vote for president, but how to vote for president. What's the intentional process that a follower of Jesus Christ should go through in order to make a decision about this aspect of citizenship? We talked last week out of Exodus chapter 18 about how we need to examine the platforms of each major candidate for president. A platform is a vision of their preferred future for the country. It's a great way to get a snapshot of what this candidate wants America to look like. We also talked about using prayerful discernment. I called it voting by prayer. That is taking this process to the Lord so that we can act both in a clear conscience and with the permission of the Spirit of God to vote in a particular way. The text also reminded us that we are to look at past performance. We have an unusual uh, arrangement this year because we have an incumbent president with three and a half years of daily documented behavior. We see what this president has done while in office. We also have a candidate on the other side that has something like 47 years of service as a politician in Washington. So there's long track records here that we can examine to study past performance. Now let me read you the verses from Exodus 18 that we, that we started with, and I want to finish this week uh, a description of this process. Remember this is Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, who's giving him advice about how to select leaders and where to appoint them so that Moses isn't the solitary leader over a nation of two million Israelites. He says, what you're doing is not good. This is Jethro speaking. You will certainly wear out both yourself and these people who are with you because the task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. Now listen to me and I will give you some advice and God be with you. You be the one to represent the people before God and bring their cases to Him. Instruct them about the statutes and laws and teach them the way to live and what they must do. In other words, present the platform of what we believe and where we're going. Then he said, you should select from all the people able men. Select this prayerful, discerning, intentional uh, process that brings God into the equation as we make a decision. He says select able men. That has to do with their past performance, their proven ability to lead. But he goes on from there, and that's, this is what I want us to see in, in this session of Truth Currents. He says, he says, you should select from all the people able men, God-fearing, trustworthy, and hating dishonest prophet. Place them over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. He starts by saying you should assess their character. Now, he gives us three characteristics uh, that, that, they, that we should look for. He says, find men who are God-fearing, trustworthy, and uh, this, this version says hating dishonest prophet. Uh, some of the older translations saying uh, hate bri hating bribes. Let's talk about this. There needs to be this statement, God-fearing, points to a perceptible piety in the life of a presidential candidate. Now, a common objection against this expectation is that people say, well, wait a minute, the United States has never allowed a religious test for an, a, a political office in this country. That's correct. Um, there's a distinction between what I would call theological righteousness and political righteousness, or maybe a better term would be civic virtue. Our founding fathers specifically didn't want a religious test for political office that said you have to be a Christian and you have to be this kind of a Christian. The 13 colonies were coming together. They had varied uh, state churches in different colonies. They had uh, different priorities. Maryland was primarily uh, a Catholic uh, colony. Uh, Rhode Island was filled with dissenters. Uh, Pennsylvania was filled with Quakers. Uh, the background was such that they intentionally didn't want to say you have to be a Christian of this kind of person, but they did say you have to have some basic level of, of public piety or, or civic virtue. In other words, when we talk about theological 
when we talk in theological terms, we mean righteousness is about being saved, about being washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, about living a life of pursuing Jesus. But in political terms, when we talk about civic virtue, we simply mean somebody that acknowledges that there is a God that they answer to, not somebody that has to have a particular expression of a particular religion, but somebody that we can trust who understands that they are not God. Civic piety. It doesn't mean moral perfection, but it does mean a basic standard of character that is necessary for political leadership. Uh, our problem is we live in a nation where our political system, our public square, is often characterized by outright br brazen lying. What this means is we need to do our best to try and avoid leaders who are known liars. It's one thing when somebody does something wrong and they, and they try and cover it up. What we're talking about here is avoiding those people who are liars by nature. Well, a nation cannot long survive if we can't have some level of confidence that what we're being told by our political leaders will in fact be what they carry out. The text says God-fearing, this sort of basic uh, level of acknowledging that God is, is real, followed by the term trustworthy. Trustworthy means that this person has to have a proven dependability. Besides this sort of civic piety that, that is necessary, um, the word trustworthy basically means, does this person do consistently what he says he will do? It describes somebody who can be trusted when they say something. Now, it's easy for us to be cynical and say, well, you know, you can't trust a politician no matter what he says. And yet, we're looking at the standard that we're to strive for. Who says what they'll do and then does it? Versus who will say whatever they need to say in front of whatever their audience happens to be in order to advance their political prospects. God-fearing, trustworthy, public piety, a basic level of proven dependability, but then also personal integrity. It says, who hates dishonest gain. It's the third critical mark of, a, of someone who would be a, a leader in, in national politics. This trait is about integrity. It's, uh, it, it really reflects what, we, what the writer of Proverbs tells us when he says that a ruler who listens to lies will have an administration that is corrupt. In other words, it's not only the, the, the ability for the president himself uh, to have a, a hatred for dishonest gain, a, uh, an aversion to corruption, if you will, but it suggests that we pay attention to the people who surround these candidates to see what they look like. Are they corrupt? Do they have an aversion to corruption? Um, the phrase means a person who hates dishonest gain or who hates bribery, such a person, a person that serves in political office for the specific purpose of enriching himself is a person who is not qualified to receive your vote or mine. This person that we hope will be in the White House is a person who always abhors even the thought of owing favors to unscrupulous donors because of the exchange of money. One of the disturbing questions as an American citizen that has bothered me um, most of my life is this issue of how our politicians tend to go to Washington and leave after decades of, quote, service only to see that they are much wealthier when they leave Washington than they were when they arrived. Well, the salary of elected officials is public knowledge. How do you have uh, the salary that we see our officials have? How do you serve for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years and leave Washington as a millionaire? I'm not sure all the details that can answer that kind of question, but I know that the Bible is suspicious of people that gain wealth through, quote, public service. 
Well, we also need to assess their ability to do the job in practical ways. This text says once you find men who have who pass the character test, he says you should uh, you should appoint them, place them over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. In other words, he says assess their ability to do the job, and then put them in a place that's appropriate for the skill set that they bring to the. Uh, to the conversation. Um, the question simply put is this, it can be simply put this way, can this person do the job that he's applying for? Moses was instructed to take his selections and assign them, some over groups of a thousand, some over groups of a hundred, some over groups of fifty, and some over groups of ten. It's what we call, he was trying to avoid what we've come to call in our day the Peter Principle. It was named after Lawrence Peter, who published the concept in 1969, and the Peter Principle says that rather than automatically promote people until they reach the level of their incompetence, that you shouldn't have automatic advancement, but that you should select people to fit the jobs that they're most qualified and capable to perform. The reality is that not every politician in America is qualified for every political opening. There is no automatic advancement in America. You don't get to be president just because you hang out in Washington for decades. There's no shame in keeping political leaders at their level of competence. Jethro spoke wisely when he said match job assignments with recognizable and proven skill sets we might say even with mental capacity so that they serve in a place where they can be successful rather than a place where they just aspire to power. So, how do we select a candidate in 2020? In order to answer that question about who we vote for, we have to study the party platforms, we have to see what each party holds as their vision for the America of the future. We have to consider vice presidential selections and the choice of other counselors and political appointees. It tells you a great deal about a candidate by the people that he surrounds himself with. We ponder the proposed choices that they, have, that they will announce that, regarding the judges of this nation. One of the things in Scripture that, that, that irks God almost more than anything else are people who pervert justice. And he is rabidly uh, against, God is, rabidly against judges who judge unfairly because they put an inordinate burden on the poor, the needy, and the, uh, the oppressed. So the vision of candidates for judges should be a major consideration in your thought process. We ponder all of those things, and then we fall on our knees, and we seek the face of God. There are really two approaches that I hear in evangelical circles in 2020 about this election. The first approach is what I've called the conscience voter. This is the person who says, I cannot in good conscience vote for candidate A, so I'm not going to participate at all. Well, I've already dealt with that. Non-participation is not an issue. The other, the other side of this equation, besides the conscience voter, is, is what I've called a strategic voter. A strategic voter says, well, since candidate A is the worst possible candidate in the history of the human race, I'm going to vote for candidate B. Well, there's no basis in Scripture for voting for somebody who is incompetent or unacceptable by biblical standards simply because you, like, you, you dislike the other guy more. I understand those struggles. I really appreciated the writings of Randy Alcorn over recent years in the political realm. He helps me reframe this conversation because he suggests that we should quit using this language, well, I just have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Well, honestly speaking, Unless Jesus Christ comes and runs for political office himself, isn't every election at every level, in a sense, the lesser of two evils? I mean, every politician is compromised by a sin nature. 
So instead of the lesser of two evils, Randy Alcorn suggests that we talk in terms of the best available option. Since there are no perfect candidates, who meets the biblical expectations, the ideal that we know we can't achieve, but the ideal that is presented that we want to hold our candidates up to? I understand both the conscience voter and the strategic voter. In fact, I want to be both of those things. I cannot vote in a way that contradicts my conscience. I just can't do it. But I do understand what's at stake, and I want to make a strategic choice. So those people who say, well, I just can't participate. Well, I dealt with that last week. Non-participation is not an option. If you take the salt and you put it back on the shelf in the pantry, if you take light and you lock it away in a closet, all you've actually done is invited the enemy to have free run in our generation. We can't do that. With a projected 130 million voters going to the polls in November this year, it may seem like your lone vote really doesn't matter in the overall scheme of things, but to a degree, my vote will shape my own soul, and I will be accountable to God for only one vote in the whole country. <laughs> Therefore, I have to take my vote seriously. I'm committed to studying the platforms, watching the selection of advisors and running mates, analyzing the words and the actions of the candidates, and then going to the Lord in prayer to seek direction and permission to cast my vote. If God gives me permission to vote for a particular candidate, then my conscience is clear, and because my conscience is clear, I'm obedient before God, I can vote. Some of us are more inclined to the conscious, conscience side of the debate. Some of us are more inclined to the strategic side of the debate. Ultimately, you don't need me to give you a choice for president. What you need is a process for discerning how to be a godly citizen even when citizenship is hard. Remember this, God promises wisdom to those who ask. This is Truth Currents.